Welcome to the Online Great Books podcast brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener. Welcome back to the Online Great Books podcast. My name is Brett. I am the producer. And today on the show, today on the show, he says, like we did one yesterday, Scott and Carl are going to adventure into the ideas of John Sr. through a biography by Francis Bevel called John Sr. and the Restoration of Realism. They're going to tell you all this in just a minute. Now, I thought we would depart from our new format of putting out very long shows once in a while And I would go back to our old way of doing things where I split this one into two parts because, number one, I found a really nice place for a cliffhanger to encourage you all to come back next week. And number two, the conversation is very dense. And with certain shows, it can be very beneficial to have a whole week right in the middle of the discussion to digest everything that uh, has been said. And this show is no exception. So yes, that's a departure from the way we've been doing things, but if you have been you know, following the show over the last few months, it must be pretty clear to you at this point that we can do whatever we want. And that being said, thank you so much for coming back, for downloading this show, and for giving Scott and Carl your time and attention. You can learn more about Online Great Books at OnlineGreatBooks.com. You can jump on the mailing list there and learn more about the program, Scott and Carl actually wind up discussing in detail in the conversation today. Please check back next week for part two in this conversation. Thank you again for your time, and here we go. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Schute. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about uh, Francis Bethel's book on our friend John Sr. What's the name of the book? Uh, John Sr. and the Restoration of Realism. There you go. The world's worst biography. It, it doesn't tell you anything about the details of the life of John Senior pretty much till the end. Yeah. It's because his his ideas are what mattered. Yeah. So who was he? Well, he is one of my heroes. Where was he born? I can't remember. Oh, I don't know. Somewhere out east. See, that's the thing. Where are the basic facts? They don't matter, really. Long Island. Gross. I don't know. Somewhere out east. Yeah, so it, it, I'm going to I'm going to guess he was born in the 20s or 30s, I can't remember. Something like this out east after a bunch of flailing ends up uh, being Catholic, later on ends up at the University of Kansas where he starts the Integrated Humanities Studies program, I think is what they called it. I haven't read this book in 3 years, so this is all out of my crammed memory. That is a great books program or was a great books program and actually probably the best one ever. Sorry to everybody else. <laughs> probably the best one ever. And as part of that program, he would take young people to Europe in the summers. After doing that for well, he would take maybe he would take 12 or 15 kids and he would come back to Kansas with in minus 1. Because over the years, he a number of those Jayhawk kids ended up joining a monastic order over there. Now, this isn't why he's great. It's maybe maybe one of the reasons, but after 20 years of or 20 years later or maybe even 30 years later, these kids that he took over there are now middle-aged guys with skills and maturity and so on, and the monastery decided it was time to plant The mother monastery in France decided it was time to plant a new monastery using these Midwestern men. After a search, they bought some land near Holbert, Oklahoma, and started Clear Creek Monastery. You guys have heard us talk about it here before. Meanwhile, John Sr. wrote several books, uh, The Restoration of Christian Culture, The Decline of Christian Culture, The Restoration of Christian Culture. That's the sequel. The sequel. And this biography here caused me and my wife to throw everything up in the air and wreck our lives. <laughs> I was interested in, in in hearing you talk about that. You mentioned that the other day, so that your wife read this book and said, I guess we're moving. 
Yeah. Z were living a comfortable life, a comfortable bourgeois life in Tulsa. Had you not heard that? In before? a very nice neighborhood. I think I had, but yeah. I reheard it. Yeah. Sometimes I rehear stories from you. <laughs> it's dementia. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to know, like, what was it about the book? Maybe we talk about this later, but I want to know what it is, what was it about this book about this Kansas professor that made you want to drop everything and move? Is it time for this story? Well, we could tell it now. Yeah. Brett could always tag it on the end if it's better. Yeah. Well, the name of the biography is The Restoration of Realism. That's the title, actually. That is probably should be the title of his book, The Restoration of Christian Culture. For our secular friends that are listening to this, do not let that title put you off. You need to read the book. He has some assumptions under that book that he doesn't flesh out. He just dives into the book and you go, you just rollick along with him. But one of his assumptions, and I think it's right, is that proper Christian culture is the underpinning behind the real metaphysics that built the West and the metaphysics that tied, tied, past tense, science to reality. And he thinks that we are getting away from being tied to the real world and that our metaphysics is busted. And he wrote this book. I don't even know when he wrote it. What's the date on the restoration of Christian culture? Carl, I don't know. Let me look. I don't know. I, I have to, I'd have to look on the internet. I'm looking it up right now. Um, and he built the school with two other men at the university of Kansas around these ideas. So he, he built that program to help restore the tie between these young students and reality. What, well, okay, so what does that mean, that we're 19, not tied to reality? 1983 is when he wrote this, and he, and he started the program at, in Kansas in the late 60s, early 70s. So he was concerned yeah. about this that early. What do, you mean, what do we mean by not tied to reality? People have jobs where their entire job is to put numbers in cells, in databases, and spreadsheets. People are confused by their genitals. I mean, I could just go on and on. People are, they're alienated from their food. You know, I, I've got a very dear friend. Uh, I'm going to tell the story on him, not to be ugly to him, but this is one of my dearest, oldest friends. He came to visit me uh, about a month ago, and we toured the place, and he followed me around for a day doing all the things I do. And it was dinner time, and we served a chicken that we had raised in turnips and potato. It was all, it was food we'd raised, you know? And he said, wow, this chicken's really good. He said, I, 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 I didn't know that there would be this big of a difference. I said, well, thank you. You know, there is. <laughs> and, and I said, how come now I'm not getting on to you, but why didn't you buy order any chickens from me? And he said, well, when you sent me the instruction sheet, I was put off by it. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? So in the instruction sheet, it says, we're going to kill these chickens and butcher them and make them ready for cooking. And when you pick them up, you need to bring an ice chest and put them on ice because their body temperature, I mean, there's, I think their body temperature is 104. And we'll ice them down and we'll let you have them and they'll be about 50. But they're warm, you know, and you need to put them on ice or they could be spoiled if you have a, dry, a long drive before you get to your freezer. And he said, He said he was so put off with the idea that that had been hot meat, like live hot flesh, that he couldn't bear it. Right. Well, the reality of it is, is that chicken was a live animal, and it had a body temperature of, I think, 104. That's the reality of it. But we're divorced from that, and there are philosophical... Well, people don't think philosophy has real consequences. There are real consequences from being divorced from the reality of that situation. Now, my dear friend, I love him so much. I really do. I, I, I called, I texted him. I said, I'm getting ready to put out the chicken order form. And I know how you are. So you need to be thinking about if you want any. If you don't, I will not be hurt. But you need to think about it because they're going to sell out in, th- in two days. And it's going to take you eight days to think about it. So start thinking. I'm giving him a head start, you see. <laughs> 
and he called me and he said, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy, you know, X chickens. And I said, okay, well, good. You don't have to. He says, no, no, no. He said, I need to be able to do that. He says, if I can't do that, then I need to never eat chickens. <laughs> and I agree. Like, I totally agree. And I'm actually living that way, right? I read this book that Senior's reading that wrote, and I'm like, well, you know what? If I can't raise my food and kill it and eat it, then I don't need to eat it either. You know, if I can't live complete congruity with the reality of all of it, then I don't need to live either. Or, let me be less drastic, then I'm not living, maybe. So he wants to bring so that's people a, to reality. That's his project. Yeah, reality. But there's, I think there, we could flesh that out a bit. It's not just realism with respect to food. What? Okay, so there's this famous painting of the School of Athens. Raphael painted it. We were chatting about it last night in seminar. We were talking about Aristotle's physics. And he begins with the, the problem of realism actually realism, but what do we mean actually. by realism so is there anything that is real that does not depend on for its being on your opinion of it right of course in the school of athens in the center of the thing there's the old plato and the younger aristotle and plato is pointing up and aristotle is pointing out at the things in front of him and you can just say the question is where is reality? Where is the real? And they're both realists, in my opinion, because Plato thinks there's real things too. He just thinks they're the forms. But that there's something that is there to be discovered by you and not created by you. That learning is discovery and not construction. Right. But we always have that. I have that problem uh, in seminars. We were talking about math. That was a good seminar last night. I got called a jackass. That was fun. <laughs> They're learning. <laughs> well, I was, I was kind of, I was taking the opposite position as one does, um, and pointing out that that Aristotle had to do some work to get us to reality. He has to dispose of Parmenides and Heraclitus, who are both non-realists. You know that you can't get to anything real. It's all either illusion or flux or something. And Aristotle's like, no. We, there are real things out there. And and he has this hidden premise. He has an empty meme that if it were not the case, the world would not be knowable. <sighs> and the hidden premise is that the world must be knowable, that the human soul is somehow proportioned to reality, that it can partake of it. Right. And the postmodern project, which is an actual thing. This is not a political epithet I'm throwing around. The postmodern project undermines that. Yes. Well, the postmodern project is, I mean, it's a product of, it's its the will to power. I mean, it's the will to power in a way Nietzsche would have hated, but... Expand on that, Carl. It's been a long time. <laughs> it has. This is fun. Well, it's a rejection of reality. I think it's actually, I think it's probably all born out of resentment. It is... The problem with reality, okay, is that there is such a thing as better and worse. Right. Okay, it, there are hierarchies. Yep. If you believe in reality, then you have there are to natural believe hierarchies. in hierarchies. Yeah, it's actually one of Thomas Aquinas's proof for the existence of God is that there are hierarchies, therefore there is a best. I think it's number four in the Summa, in the Big Summa. Well... We don't like hierarchies. What if you're not the best? And, and none of us are. What if you're? <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, but what if I'm you're not very fast at all? Okay, so there you are in high school, and there, there's the quarterback. Okay, it's the the best athlete who's a little bit smart. Okay, becomes the quarterback, the most important position in in football, and his girlfriend is probably the prettiest girl, and everything's going right for them. They're they're beautiful and handsome and and everything's going right. How does that make you feel? If you are less than them, you might feel like I hate those two. There's something wrong with them. Why? Because they're so beautiful. You know they they have um, 
They are callous kaiaganthos. They are beautiful and good. And you're not. So there you are sitting in, in the uh, the AV club. Nothing, <laughs> nothing against the AV club. But, you know, if you're a high school loser, okay, you're going to resent the ones that aren't. Right. And if you happen to come to power, and you might, you might come to power, then you can make it so that the there isn't any such thing as beauty ever again because it offends you. I think this is probably the real motive of the, the modern project is is the upending of hierarchies because hierarchies bug people. That there could be reality is is a problem. Um other thing about reality is if there if there is a real then I can live in accordance with reality or I can depart from it. In other words, I can seek the good or I could seek the not good. That is a burden to your conscience. I could go wrong. Well, maybe I don't like that. And so you, you uh, well, you can kill your conscience by just saying there's nothing for it to be conscious of. Conscious of. Conscience is your your rationality's judgment of, of right or wrong. And if you don't like it, well, you just say, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Conscience goes away. Right. It's a good, it's a good trick. So when are we going to read Adorno? Uh, I don't know. You want to read it next? I uh, I don't really ever want to, <laughs> but we might need to. Uh, I have I ordered a book the other day, Carl, that I'm very interested in. It is called "Looking Hell: The Cultural Cold War" by Francis Stoner Saunders. The CIA in the world of arts and letters. <laughs> digs in and, and show and shows the records on, you know, we all know about the Jackson Pollock thing. Well, how about, Ant well, maybe they don't. And so I could just hear people. They're, they're like yelling at you. I don't know if they listen to this, if they typically yell at you, but they're saying, there goes, there goes Hamburg on another uh, conspiracy thing. And no, it is not a conspiracy. The CIA absolutely funded. Hell, they overthrew the government of Guatemala and you're going to doubt that they were in the arts. Right. Yeah. They funded, um, they funded Pollock. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Ornette Coleman, which is garbage, Rothko. But but in this book, uh, he also shows Hannah Arendt, Leonard Bernstein, George hmm. Orwell. What if Orwell is uh, predictive programming? What if it's not a cautionary tale? Yeah, I'm getting ready to read this. That might be a fun one for us, Uncle Carl. Yeah. But back to John Sr. <sighs> John Sr., through all his trials and tribulations, you know, uh, he, he dabbled with Eastern religion. Uh, he dabbled with being a ranch hand, a man of letters, all kinds of stuff. He had a full life. Um, he decided that we were divorced from reality and that that was the major problem with his people. I don't know what that means, right? I don't know if that means, you know, anyone that he could reach or if that means the West. I don't know. I'm just saying his people. And that that being divorced from reality had disastrous civilizational consequences. And the reason it had disastrous civil, civilizational consequences is because it has disgusting spiritual consequences. He worked his whole life to set that set that right as best as he could. So I read that book, uh, The Restoration of Christian Culture, and uh, finished it one night, and I handed it to my wife and said, hey, you, you know, you've got to read this. Well, she read it, and when she got done, she closed the book. We were laying in bed. She closed the book, and she said, well, I guess we're moving. And the answer is we did. We did. Yeah. We sold everything and moved in moved out and lived close to the weather and to try to grow more food and work. <sighs> I haven't read that book. I only have read the, the auto, the biography. I'm trying to find something. Uh, I'm not going to dig for quotes. I'm just going to recall it with my memory. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in, in Bethel's book, uh, he quotes John senior talking about, well, so they had an interesting approach at the Integrated Humanities Program at the University of Kansas. They did not read any Aristotle, for example. Mm -hmm. 
he identifies so you have grammar logic rhetoric and poetic i think so he kind of has a fourth liberal art i would have put that under rhetoric but i get what he's doing it's uh the preparation of the imagination i guess to see the beauty in things and so they focused a whole lot more on poetry and he actually at one point said maybe we did it too much so it was a two-year program and they, they would do ballroom i mean they would do dancing they would teach them to dance you know because nobody knows how to behave with the opposite sex and in a way that's not you know i mean what do you do it it's so important so you would join the Internet Integrated Humanities uh, Department, IHS, as I think the way they called it. And you would do that in addition to whatever it was you were studying. It wasn't a degree path. It was uh, something else, an add-on there at the University of Kansas. And they would read so many of the things we read at online great books. No Aristotle, which I understand. We need to come back and talk, to that, talk about that. And he wanted to he and the other two founders of that program wanted to root these kids in reality and recalibrate them. And they ran into a lot of challenges. One of the challenges is, is they weren't, they were not educated or familiar with their own tradition. We'll talk about that. He, you know, he says, if you're going to read the Iliad, all of these quote unquote great books, you need to read a thousand good books. So young people need to have yeah. read their King Arthur. They need to know their Aesop's fables. There, there's a lot of small ball they need to have played before they go play, you know, play with the big books. And 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 another thing he ran into was they didn't know how to interact with each other, and they didn't know what how to use their bodies. And he talks in the book a uh, uh, restoration of Christian culture about the problem of risk taking and using bodies. <laughs> And he thinks that kids need to under, undertake, they need to have a hand in physical work. They need to live close to the weather. When it's hot outside, they need to be hot. When it's cold outside, they need to be cold. And they need to experience the weather in the seasons so they understand the world around them. And they need to mm -hmm. undertake risky play. He's like, you know, we don't want anybody to be hurt. But kids need to fall out of a tree and maybe cut their finger with a pocket knife. And, you know, they need, they need to experience while it's safe, experience danger. So they need to be put in a position to have risky play. Okay. How do you do that if you're at a college, at a, at a land-grant college in the Midwest? Well, one of the ways is the ballroom dancing. It's risky. You're going to dance with a girl that you don't know, and she's going to dance with a boy she doesn't know, and she might step on his foot, or he might do the wrong thing. And, uh, you know, you, you've got, and you've got to move in three dimensional space and adding the fourth mm -hmm. dimension, which is time. Like the, this is a really good laboratory for, for learning some of these things that he, that, that he saw where these kids were in deficit of. Well, and you might even, uh, experience the romantic, uh, you got your hand in the small of that, that girl's back and she's holding your hand and, and looking at your eyes and, Things might happen, but the things that might happen are different than would happen in typical course of dating. Right. And, and by the way, there's a, a built in distance. He's seeing these problems with these young people in the 70s. Yeah. You know, and, and with people tend to, nowadays, those are the good old days. That's 40 and 50 years ago. So you can't teach people stuff because. The soil's not right. They're not and that right. was the image that I was trying to dig up. You know, the soil's just not good. Uh, if you do any sort of gardening or farming, you find out that the soil is crap and that you have to add amendments to make it better before you can get the vegetables that your grandparents knew. You know, you, you just can't do it. Uh, and I was talking to a, a client of mine, a strength, a weightlifting client who is an art professor about this you know like in music I, i've been i've been listening to a whole lot of classical music since we haven't done a music and ideas for a while i don't have to listen to any rock and roll right now i can just listen to classical music and so i've been digging into sonatas well i don't know what the hell a sonata is you know so you've talked about that do we even have the framework to listen to this music we don't i don't believe we do and i'm tr 
I'm trying to regain it. I got a book from 1895 on the history of the sonata for the pianoforte. I'm trying to figure out what makes a sonata an exposition, a development, a recapitulation. Well, now I'm going to try to go listen and get examples. And uh, the the art professor I was talking to, he says it's the same thing. You can you have students come in and they can see maybe that the thing's pretty, but that's it, mm -hmm. and have no idea what's going on. The rich soil our ancestors had the rich intellectual soil that they had has been denuded. It's been sucked away. It's been carted off and you need to rebuild it before you can even, it's not that you shouldn't read the Iliad, but it's going to show you how much you don't have, you know, what depth you don't have. That's been, it's been, it's the consequences of the postmodern project. It's all been stolen from you. And industrialization. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. It's, I mean, why would you even read Shakespeare? I agree. If, if we've destroyed... <laughs> oh. You need to read the sonnets, though. Uh, but why would you read it if all literature is the same and opinions of goodness and badness are mere opinions? You know, if there isn't the real, the reason you might want to read Shakespeare is because he tells you something about the real in a beautiful way well if there's no such thing as reality why are you going to slog through elizabethan english mm. you know it's like a, a jeremy bentham uh who is a utilitarian philosopher had this famous quote uh pushpin equals poetry pushpin was pinball it doesn't matter what your pleasures are as long as you're experiencing pleasure nothing is better than anything else and then you find out that you can't experience any higher pleasures it's frustrating yahtzee uh so anyway the, the, it's regenerative agriculture except for the intellect by the mid to late 60s senior had already not only identified the problem but started formulating a method to overcome that problem and remediate it and he did that with that integrated um, humanities studies program at the university of kansas and the proof yeah, and, lives on. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who went through that program and had been, you know, touched by the by his work who have lived a substantially better life by their own admission than they would have if they hadn't. Francis Bethel that wrote that wrote this biography is one of those people. I think so I'm one the of those Archbishop people. of Oklahoma City, for example, is one of those people. I just found out. Yeah, you know, there are all kinds of like Catholic clergy and you know bishops and whatever that came out of out of out of his program. But you know what? There are hundreds and hundreds of people who got married in on the dance floor in his program that you'll never know anything about. You know, that's more important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to say it again. I already said it once. I'm going to say it again. I'll probably say it four more times because it needs to be said. Even if you're a secular person, even if you're some wackadoo Calvinist or whatever, you need to read the restoration of Christian culture because whether you like it or not, we, we were steeped in this culture. We were at some point all culturally that, and we're losing My, it. And he, and he shows yeah. you how we're losing it. And then he tells you how to fix it. Well, and my dear Protestant listeners, there's a danger cuts right through Protestantism that leads to anti-realism. You have to be careful. And it's the idea of the total depravity of nature. Oh, listen. By the way, I think I'm probably Protestant, but not like they are. I'm this weird, Amer not a weird, I'm this American individualist, whatever. I can't, hardly, I can't stand church hierarchy. It makes me fucking sick. I hate it. I hate it. Emersonian. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the local parish, whatever, and have some retard, you know, govern. I can't stand it. I hate it, and my, and that's probably one of my failings. But I'm Protestant in that way, whatever. But I was just reading Thomas, uh, book three, the beginning of book three of the Little Summa. You've read that recently, right? Not too recently. I I'm doing four because I have a seminar coming oh, up okay. on it. Where was I going with this before you got uh, all fired up? 
Yeah, uh, you didn't want to go to a church and be governed by oh the total depravity thing. Yeah. Now, all through the little summa, summa contra gentiles, Thomas makes arguments based on or fleshing out Socrates' arguments in the Gorgias, where he, where Socrates says we always do things for the good. He's like, you might do something bad, but you were doing it because you thought you were doing something good. You might have a malformed opinion of what the good is. You might misjudge. You've made an error if it's not actually capital G good, the thing that you did. You know, Carl's example is uh, nobody smokes cigarettes because they want cancer. They like that nicotine and are looking for the stimulating effect and the calming effect of the, the, you know, fiddling with it with their hands, whatever. So everybody's pursuing the good. Now, when I read that in the Gorgias, I was like, Seems right. Like, I, I just judged it like phenomenology, you know? I'm like, yeah, that seems right. Like, that rapist, you know, he, he seeks that high as a value higher than any harms he's causing. Or maybe he likes causing the harm, right? Right. That's like a hedonistic value to him. So people people will see this. Later, <laughs> a thousand years later, 1,500 years later, 2,000 years later, Aquinas says... People have the ability to act. And insofar as you can act, you're good. And acting, you know, and there's a big long proof here that it takes you several hundred pages to catch. But he says, you know, the the act of moving from potentiality to actuality is itself good. And insofar as you act at all, that is creative and it is good. And after reading, you know, several hundred pages of him fleshing this out, they're like, yeah, that, that's true. I believe that that's true. And if it's true, man is, cannot be totally depraved. There is a depravity there. There is a wound. There is a problem, but man is not that in total, right? Insofar as we can act, we're good. I don't want to get too much in doctrinal disputes, but the the danger I see is that if you're if you take this too seriously or too strongly, then you break the connection with reality. Because if your nature has been depraved, then you can trust none of its sensations, right? You can't say that you're in touch with reality. And and so it leads very easily into postmodernism. You know, once the, a few generations later, when all of your kids lose their faith, they become Foucault. If you believe they, that you're totally depraved and that the body is base, and you have to mortify the flesh, right? The, the, the body is the instrument whereby we interact with the world, right? Your sense data comes in there. Aristotle, right. Aristotle's big on the senses. Aquinas is big on the senses. The West used to be big on the senses, right? We would look at gauges. We would measure things. You know, we would make scientific discoveries. Oh, gosh, just walk, on walk through an old cathedral. Yeah, but... but it's a feast for the senses. If you think man is totally depraved, you ultimately cannot trust the sense. And if you cannot you trust You cannot the trust sense, your own reason either. You can't trust your reason. And the gap between you and reality grows and grows and grows. Yeah. John Sr. and the Restoration of Realism. Right. So be careful out there. I want to talk about the modes of knowing. I want to talk about poetry. So he's got, let's see, where is it? Four modes of knowledge. You have to excite. Well, they couldn't quite do musical education because they got the kids too late. But I want to read a quote. This is page 159. You don't have your book, but I've got mine here. Oh, I remember page Uh, 159. Yeah, of course you do. He's got a photographic memory, at least for producers in in music. Uh, Certainly one needs to develop and discipline a variety of emotions. Even anger and fear have their place. But Senior tells us that the goal of musical education is wonder. He also affirms, and this is the quote, the purpose of propedeutic, that is gymnastic and music, is not knowledge, but love. Think about that for a bit. So you sign your kid up for gym class maybe you think that's for general health well you're wrong that's not what it's for and you you sign them up for music class because maybe they'll get a scholarship or maybe it'll help like you do music 
for the sake of helping their SAT score. Because students who study music do better in math. Well, that's the wrong reason. Yeah, yeah what's the good? You, you move your body and you listen to music and read wonderful stories to awaken love within you. It's There's a very Aristotelian idea that the point of education, well, it's Platonic. The point of education is that you love correctly, or maybe in our case, that you love at all. Right. You and I need to debate how we do music education. I think you're all wrong about it, Carl. Okay. <laughs> no, you're not all wrong about it. I don't think it works. The soil's no good. Yeah. I have some background in music and have some of the furniture necessary to listen to a sonata and get something from it and understand what is happening. Yeah, all of that. I do have some of that. But I think that the music education needs to be scaled way back. We've lost it. It's too late. You know, when I listen to when I listen to Beethoven, I recognize its greatness and I understand at least some of it. But it's not mine. It's no longer mine. I, there's nothing I can do to get it back. And in my opinion, I, I think we need to scale it back. I think we need to have, you know, loot lessons. L U T E. No, I, I'm well, serious. And maybe L O O T. <laughs> well, we don't. We can just, you know, watch TV for that. But yeah, I think it needs to be simplified way, way back. And I find myself listening almost exclusively to music that was recorded in the twenties, in the last year or so. And mm -hmm. and and part of that's I'm weird. But the but I was like, why am I doing this? These recordings suck, and these guys aren't very good. It's because they're not good. Like there was a guy named Ralph Peer that went to Bristol, Tennessee and rented a hotel room and put an ad in the paper and says, if you can play, come on down, I'll record you. And these people poured out of the hills and they are people that learned on their front porch, you know, and they poured out of the hills and recorded them. And he found the Carters and he found Jimmy Rogers in that same hotel room. So, so those recordings from the twenties are people who aren't pros professionals. They're not professionals, you know, and it's just this natural outpouring of who they were and where they were. I, I think if we're going to rebuild it, we have to start with that, not with the twenties, but an, but a, an organic music that is simple and not professional and less risky. How's Beethoven risky? You can't do that. You can't do it. You know, it, it, it's like going it's like going to Papua New Guinea in 1915 and landing a 747. You know, you can't do it. They can't get it. It's just fucking magic. Well, it, it's, you get it's, eaten. <laughs> get Eat from pot or get in pot. Um, <laughs> it, it's too much. You know, we can't scaffold back into that. Like, if you want to teach somebody how to build an airplane, you're going to have, probably have to start... If you showed up in like Norway in 850 AD and you want them to teach them how to build right. an airplane, you probably have to start with like wood mill work or something. Uh, okay. So my counter argument, uh, I can see most of that, that it is certainly really difficult. On the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, because I am a realist, there is something real there you know i was reading um so i was reading his book on the sonata you get some Where's quote there? from 1593 it is conducive to have a slow movement after a fast movement and to have variety in movements there is a reality to music so sure. I mean, even back in the 16th century somebody is saying well yeah if you're gonna have the fasting follow it with the adagio and then hit him again with the the rondo you know um it'll it'll be great you know, we talked about this when we did our, our temperament show. There is a, a physics of music. Uh, the octave is a relation of two to one. What did the fifth is three to one, something like that. Uh, there are mathematical relationships behind it. And humans still have ears that connect to their brains and therefore into their minds. So when you're listening to music, you're listening to reality. I, I don't believe in the total depravity of 
in art, you know, that, that we just cannot do it. It's just difficult to do it. I concede. Sure. I don't quite know how to do it. We've probably bungled it. What we, all of our kids play music. I have a subscription to a music service that they, they get to listen to a couple of them. I mean, they all listen to stuff. They all have their favorites. One of them sneaks away to listen to Brahms, you know, so she's, she's developed it on her own. We're actually going to the symphony this weekend. That's going to be, and they were cheerful and wanted to go. You know, I said, well, let's go, let's go hear the symphony and uh, we're going to do it. I haven't really forced them other than you got to take piano lessons. Right. No, I, I, I hear you, but I think that that, you know, the relations and relationships you, that are in harmonies or whatever, or, you know, this, these forms that are in the sonata, they can learn that from the bridge in a folk song and from harmonizing with their sister. Oh, sure. You know, yeah, and, well, it's it, the same thing, uh, it, it, but it's, but it's smaller and it's more accessible, right. you know? Right. Uh, you're, you're, you're not wrong, Carl, but, but, you know, if you go to, you just, I mean, if people went to the mall <laughs> And we just went and plucked four kids out of the mall. We can't do what you're talking what's, about. What's a mall? It's a pointy sledgehammer you split wood with. A mall. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to read a um, another quote from John Sr. as reported in the biography. Something about poets. And I, I read it and I, I, it's, I have said exactly this in classrooms before or almost exactly this uh so i feel like i was in good company and i don't i hadn't heard of john senior uh back when i was teaching so uh he says just as we can enlarge our capacity to think by exercise in the various scientific disciplines we can enlarge our capacity to feel by participation in the experience of art the poet is the man who says look look you never saw that before and if you follow him, you'll see much more than you would have seen by yourself. In doing so, you have enlarged your capacity to experience the world, which is another way of saying to live. I mean, what's the point of poetry? It's not relating to you facts. It's not useful in any way, except that you see more. And I don't even think it's useful necessarily, but... what well, It's useful. What do you mean? it? Poetry itself? Poetry. Yeah, yeah, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Well, by my goodness, she is. <laughs> so I never thought of it that way. Poetry, the Carolingian poetry, <laughs> is about <laughs> it's about showing people things that they hadn't seen. Right, that's what you said. Yeah, right? and that's what there aspects says. of things. I mean, I think. Uh, how about this? How about this? Reality is metaphorical. And I don't mean that it's not real. I mean that everything represents everything else. It, it, and we know things in relation to other things. Like that tree is yeah. taller or shorter than me, whatever. But the, the romantics, Carl, didn't see poetry for that. Right? They're, they're about eliciting responses in the person. It's a, it's a, it's a manipulative mm -hmm. thing. You know, it's, it's not about selective representation of reality in a way that makes that reality more accessible to the human. It's about jerking your chain. Yeah. And, and, and I think that the modern person that's, I think that's the, how they see it. I think they see poetry as a way I'm going to say manipulate. They would say a way to elicit strong feelings. You know, they would see it as a yeah. tool for that. The modern person doesn't even encounter poetry. Right. They encounter Netflix specials, which are definitely designed to jerk your chain and propagandize you and or very rarely just sit back and present something to you out of which you can grasp the real better. The number of people writing poetry is probably greater than the number of people reading poetry. And yeah. it's small, either case. People just don't do it. But to have like this perfect little poem that that sits there and it doesn't it, it's it's not visual. It's not oral, it's intellectual. So it's it's chaste, you know? It's just sitting there. There's there's something really beautiful about it, but it takes work to do. But it is it's like um is music lyric poetry? Can be. 
but it's got so much support from the music around it that it could be really bad and it doesn't matter. Clearly. So, so what you're saying is rap isn't <laughs> that rap isn't poetry, right? I don't know. I don't listen to too much of it. Some of it's kind of cool, but it, it's, you know, it's probably it, more poetry have... than a regular song lyric because there's less rhetoric around it. There's like less the, supporting it. The yeah. music is rhetoric, I think. Yeah. Uh, there's less supporting it. That doesn't mean it's good. I, I almost never hear any that's any good. It's just so bass and just, it's just not good. I'm sorry. They, I, this is my proposal to the, the rap music community. If you're listening, learn an instrument. No, you don't have to learn an instrument. Study epic poetry. Mm. Up your game. You know, do it about bigger things. One of the problems with any modern songwriter is their sense of life. And this is a pro- this is a poet problem with poetry. Well, I mean, with rap. I'm sorry, but the problem with any modern songwriter is their sense of life is small and collapsed. They have nothing to say. They don't. So if they're going to selectively represent, you know, uh, realities so that they elicit. Or so they can communicate something to the listener. Like, what would they even write about? You know. Uh, well, let's study the works of Cardi B. Mm. And you'll, uh, there's a lot of life that uh, she's putting in there. I like this this notion of the poetic mode. I, I still think it's probably part of rhetoric. But let me go another a quote here. Uh, if you're following along at home, it's page 175. The essence of poetic reasoning is metaphor, a knowledge by comparison, a moving from the known to the unknown by likeness. My love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. If you've seen June roses spring up, you can imagine and therefore know something of what my beloved is like. You know, so I, I would go, language itself is metaphorical, thought is metaphorical. So if poetry deals with metaphor, which is, uh, equating apparently dissimilar things uh, through the tool of language. In language, what you can do, you can say, you can just connect, put is in between two things. That book is an elephant. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. You're going to come up with something, and it might reveal something about elephants and books. You know, that Aristotle book is an elephant. Well, now you're starting to think, well, how is it an elephant? Well, it's big and ponderous. It's got a trunk that you have to beware of. And it, you're, everything's starting to, to scintillate and sparkle because I've made that weird comparison. Mm. But if that's the case, if he's right, then you have to do it. You have to present people with the poetic. You have to present them with useless, beautiful things. All learning is done in relation to other things. Yes. We can't just learn something in a vacuum, which poses some problems. You know, uh, you, you know, a baby is born. If all learning is done in, in relation to some other known thing, you know, how does that kid ever get anywhere? <laughs> so what's baked in when the kid is born that allows the kid to eventually develop language and learn math and whatever. But John Sr., um, I think it would tell us that, you know, studying this poetry helps people uh, see the relationships between disparate things. And in training the mind to do that allows you to learn any other given thing more easily. Yeah. um, Aristotle says that intelligence is seeing the middle term. Pattern recognition. (laughs) It's not pattern recognition. There's more than pattern. So, I mean, what good is a pattern? Listen, if there's no reality behind it, there's no such thing as a pattern to recognize. There are a bunch of people I wish could recognize patterns. Well, I know. I mean, I know it's a, a characteristic uh, of, of uh, the intellect that you'd be able to recognize I, I, I patterns. Know, I know a girl who's over six feet tall. Yeah, okay. Great. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, some people aren't so good at this kind of thing, no. you know? But, but to say... That's another topic. Uh, my love is like a red, red rose or whatever the exact quote is. Not just red, but red, red. Yeah. There's an implication there that's not on the page. And you have to, what is it? What is it? What is that implication? You make people see the thing that's not written. Um, yeah, Senior recognizes this. It would be interesting, interesting to 
have been able to have grilled him on, you know, his epistemology, see what he would have had to say about it. I'm sure he would have had plenty to say about it. He didn't, uh, he didn't have Aristotle in his program, Carl. I know. We have a lot of Aristotle in our program. Uh, We're both right. It's an approach. If you did it with just the poetry, I mean, some of us, we don't do much of the science. In fact, I don't think we do any of it. We mm-hmm. kind of do it inside things. Like you can do Euclid. Yeah. And we had the, cal- the the math group for a while. I'm not sure if they're, are they still going? No, but we need to talk to Connor and see if they'll kick it back off. Yeah. That's a commercial uh, concern though, Carl, you know, I'm not against it, but we just couldn't do everything, you know, at one line. Yeah. I, I didn't know how we would do Euclid until Emmett Penny's like, I know how let's go. There, so there were a lot of things I didn't know how to do. And then we can't do it all. So we, well, it, the, the, okay. So we have people, uh, I mean, we have an online community, <laughs> which is, is there any such thing, but we nope. do have, we try to have one, an online community, but it's online. You know, we're not seeing each other. We're not meeting every weekend and, and playing music and, and eating real food. We're, we're all over the place. If you were going to do the science stuff, well, you kind of have to go observe, you know, what is, what is Ptolemy talking about? Well, go sit out and look at the sky, you know, maybe you could do that in a group and it would be hard to do the science without a lab, Mm -hmm. a lab section where you can go and actually touch the stuff. We do a lot of poetry, but our clientele are generally older. They're not 18 year old kids where you might be able to still, maybe the poetic mode is more important for them. Maybe we're just doing it wrong. We should do it like John Senior did it. Uh, listen, sometimes I think so. So I'm reading. I'm reading Aquinas right now. I think I have more than a passing familiarity with all of these books. I've spent more time with them and um, more study of them than our average online great books member has. That's not to poop on them. That's my job. You know, that's my job. And, 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 uh, John senior only had his kids for two years to give Aquinas a fair shake. You really need to know your Plato pretty well. You really need to know your Aristotle pretty well. You Mm -hmm. need to know a few other things too. If you, if you have the time, I I think it takes for an amateur, for somebody who's not their job. (laughs) I, I think it takes seven or eight years to get to Aquinas and really give it, give it the attention it deserves you've got to read three or 4,000 pages of other things or otherwise you're just, yeah. being, otherwise you're just the guy from Papua New Guinea who sees an airplane land. <laughs> what in the, yeah. So that's why I think that's why senior didn't do it. How would you build all the prerequisites in for a, a, a student in two years? But you can't, but you know, like Chesterton somewhere says, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. I hear what he's saying, but if you throw a kid in the deep end of the swimming pool thinking he's going to learn how to swim, you might give him a water phobia. Uh I'm doing it badly. I think it takes quite a bit of work to get to the point where you can even do it badly. Yeah. Well, so, you know, when you run these seminars, sometimes people come in, they, uh, it's like, I didn't understand anything. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's not true. That's not true. You did understand something. And then we'll we'll dig around and we'll find some stuff that they got out of it. I think first time through this sort of thing, especially you know, if you haven't had a proper education, and none of us have, you know, get what you can out of it. And don't despair that you're not getting all of it. I steal a technique. I had a class on Heidegger. Uh, uh yeah, I know you're not a fan. Well, Heidegger is very, very dense, and it maybe he's a charlatan. I don't think he is, but you're not just going to read through one of his books and figure it out. So what the the professor would do, and it worked pretty well, he would just we'd start the class and he'd write five quotes on the board from the reading, mm-hmm. and we would chew on them and try to get some insight from them, and not worry too much that you didn't figure out everything that's going on in basic problems of phenomenology, you know, that it's okay. It is. It's okay. You got to do it. You got to start somewhere. 
and don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, gosh, I can't comprehend all of this. You know, it's like, okay, so you can't listen to Beethoven because you don't understand the sonata form that that is undergirding these symphonies. And you, or, okay, did you get anything out of number five? Yeah, I got da 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 da. Okay, well, that's something. That's something. You didn't get nothing. You got something. Uh, for online great books, one of the things that I'm certain that people will get from it, if they actually do it, is they benefit from the doing. I think, yes. You know, so you read The Republic and you f- close the, you finish it and you close the book, you're like, I have no idea what that was. Like the struggle, <laughs> the struggle was worth it. Yes. Uh, the, the, the Republic's way more accessible than that. But you might read, you might read book one of uh, metaphysics, Aristotle's metaphysics, and not know what happened to you. <laughs> but, but having done it is worth it. So the next time you go back, you'll be better at it. You know, th- so the process is worth uh-huh. it. But but senior, he's got a two year prob- uh, program at the University of Kansas. These kids are paying money; they're devoting their life to it for those seven hundred days, and he's got to, you know, he's got to do right as best he can with them. They didn't do seminar. Yep they they didn't they didn't let the kids discuss the books. They would have people who knew the texts get in front of the room and talk about the books. They were doing live podcasts, Carl. Yeah. With three people. I thought that was, uh, that would be fun. So we're following Mortimer Adler. They were big on the seminar and John senior is not, although he was on the, I think he was on the board of Thomas Aquinas college mm-hmm. or, or at least was associated with them. I could see the point. We get bogged. Our seminars can get bogged down in, frankly, a lot of boneheaded stuff sometimes. Like, oh well, you know, we've we've moved on beyond this, and this is quaint. You know that that guy that's in every group, a lot of that kind of shit. There's always one in the group that's like, well, you know, this guy, this is a this person is a terrible writer. You know, there's always some something like that that doesn't let just let let us actually talk about the text. Which yeah. is which is yeah, what that person is doing, whether that person knows it or not. They're wanting to not talk about the text. Mm-hmm. So they could get yeah, right so at it, it every time. A lot of the time is is what you do is like let's 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 actually let's go back to Aristotle, <laughs> page. Right. Know, I tell them a page number and uh, and drag it back. I don't know. I was if if we could do an A and a B testing for the how long does it take to get to the program. 60 months yeah uh a and b testing and have seminar versus i mean i think it's important that they do the process i do too and if you're not doing uh with a seminar you can kind of tell people have to participate uh if it were lectures so there's another problem is i am i am prepared to run seminars on aeschylus Am I prepared to lecture on Aeschylus? That's a different level, you know, where I'm letting I'm letting him be the, the teacher. Did Mr. Senior rather than lecture on him? Uh, I, I that was the impression I got that they did. I'm, I'm I don't remember. <laughs> I, I think they talked. I think the three guys get together, me, you, and Pascarella, and we hash out the text. Yeah, but in so in the podcast form, when he and, and Quinn and Nellick would, would sit together and talk, I think it was every Friday, and the students didn't have to come, but they all did. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one thing. But what were they doing in the classroom? Well, you see, I don't know. We need to call uh, Bethel and ask him. Uh, they were studying whatever it was they were supposed to study. Right, because this is an add-on. They're engineering students. They're nursing students. There are a thousand other things. I, I, I don't think there, I don't think there was much else, in terms of this program. I think they were expected yeah. to read and and keep up and do the thing. But yeah, I don't think it was like St. John's College. Yeah, those poor kids at St. John's and Thomas Aquinas. They they are sleep deprived. You know, like, when you have five hundred pages. Oh, 
to read a week. It's a, well, I don't know. They, they're they managing it somehow. They're, it's a it's a very cool place if you've never been. I haven't been to St. John's. I've been to TAC. There's a funny thing about that. that when they built it, they built it with really high ceilings uh, so that, it's in California, so that the uh, the seminar leader, the facilitator, whatever they call him, could smoke a pipe. Mm-hmm. And the smoke would go up, and it was designed for smoking. And then California banned smoking indoors. Now they have funny shaped rooms. Alas, uh, nicotine's a hell of a drug. Yeah, I do not partake, but I have partook, and it's really nice. We're running a seminar. It's it's a nice edge, you know. It's better than caffeine. But... Yeah, it is. The clarity of thought that comes from the pipe or the cigar is. Excellent. You notice we haven't yeah. been back to the moon since the smoking ban. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cigarettes powered the D-Day invasion. Yep. I want to read a quote from, this is from page 195. This is from John Sr. from The Death of Christian Culture. This gets at the, the real problem of the anti-realist position. And I, I was on another podcast with Nathan, Nathan Cheever. What's the name of that show? Oh gosh, vertical vertical thinking. I think uh, it was fun, but the the thing that I like about I particularly like about Nietzsche is he will not let you get away with imagining that uh, a non realist position is. Uh, you know, I get to sit and, and weave baskets in my in my little corner of the world. No, you you will have something enforced on you. Somebody's going to create values and and and. And do it too. So this is John Senior. He says it better than I do. If truth is nothing but opinion, right springs from the barrel of a gun. Liberalism is the smiling face of modernism. Behind it lies the grinning skull. As everybody says, we've arrived again at something like the end of ancient Rome, but worse, because after two thousand years of Christianity, we are capable of a perverse and theologically exact ap- apostasy no pagan ever knew. Yahtzee. If there isn't a hierarchy of being, if there isn't a good that all things strive towards, if it's just like my opinion, man, then somebody's going to force opinions on me. And the only reality you're going to know is violence. If you guys want some more of Carl, you can go listen to him on the Vertical Thinking with Nathan podcast. He did an episode called Nietzsche's The Gay Science with Carl Shute. You can get a little bit of extra Uncle Carl there. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, I appreciate him having me on. This is the point. Uh, it's frustrating to me. Some people just won't get it. Oh, it's not that bad. Everything's okay. No, it's not okay. Mm-mm. You're hanging over an abyss and you don't see it. If you get rid of hierarchies, in other words, if you get rid of God, uh, keep, we keep this secular. There's some principle of order in the universe. There's some good and there's some things that are less good. If you can't accept that, then pushpin equals poetry, mass murder equals Netflix. You know, it doesn't matter. You can't say that anything's wrong. All you can say is, I don't like it. Right. You can't say that it's wrong. You can't say the Nazis were wrong. You can't say Genghis Khan was wrong. You can't say anything. You you can't say I'm right. You just have to kick the shit out of everybody. Right. Right. So it's a bunch of uh, nature red in tooth and claw. I was listening to a podcast this morning. I was freezing my butt off, moving cows. And um, there was this sort of neo-reactionary guy on there, and he's a monarchist and a guy, and then there were a bunch of normie cons on there. And and these normie cons were kind of doing the Munchus mole bug thing. We're like, well, you know, uh, we have a... We have a model for you know democratic action in the modern uh, corporation, you know, where we have uh, an executive, and you know, people can people can speak freely. But once the executive decides, then it's you know, so it's authoritarian to that nature. But there is some free speech in it, and then we have a board of you know governing board, whatever. And they were all, just talking all this stupid mold bug shit, you know. And I was like, why Why do I not like this? Why do I not like this? What is, what's, what's going on in me that's making me dismissive of this? And then I realized, oh, 
in terms of corporate governance, they all hold the same good, which is shareholder value. Not stakeholder, shareholder mm-hmm. value. So yeah, this will work because we all know what the highest good is in terms of what we're doing. But if mm-hmm. you did that in terms of like governing people, we don't know what the hierarchy is. We don't know what the good is. You know, we're back to Alistair, Alistair McIntyre. We, so it won't work. Well, full stop. It won't work outside of a, of a corporation. And it might not work in corporations either, Enron. If there is no yeah. hierarchy, you can't govern. You can't even have a government. You can't even do yeah, it. That, Aquinas says, uh, we did this on, I think, an earlier seminar this week. See, I have a fun job. I get to do all this stuff. Law is an ordinance of reason for the common good promulgated by the one who has authority over the community. Okay, so uh, we got five parts of it. Ordinance, reason, common good, promulgated, authority. Okay, take out the common good. Now it's just fiat. Well, it's not an ordinance of reason because reason is connected to reality. So if there's no good, there's no reason. Now it's an ordinance promulgated by whoever's in charge. Great. <laughs> yeah, so I like your point about the the why it seems to work in corporate structures because they do have a good. It's a dollar sign. Yeah, they know what it is. It actually that's actually breaking. Like there there are companies, yes. there are companies, lots of them, more and more and more, Disney, who does things that harm their profitability. Adidas firing Kanye, whatever you think, whatever you think about that, that will show up on the annual report on the page with the profit and loss statement on it. So, you know, the, the, these different notions of what the good is are, are falling apart everywhere. And John Sr. saw it in 68. Chester, Chesterton mm-hmm. saw it in 03, 19, <laughs> you know. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? You might found uh, online great books or do the, the Integrated Humanities program. But gosh, it's a hard battle. I, I don't know that uh, the restoration of realism, I don't see any human hope of it succeeding. <laughs> <laughs>